In general, my work is related to providing network support for peer-to-peer -peer systems, P2P for short. This particular work we built a device that solves a specific problem that has recently been generating a lot of controversy. So there are essentially two points of view in P2P. There's the end user's point of view where P2P is really convenient in terms of this, it supports many applications, for example, internet telephony, Skype, for example, Skype, um, internet TV, Juice, and content delivery, Victor and Napster. Also, it offers, also P2P systems are self-scaling in the sense that every new peer which joins a P2P system contributes a portion of its upload bandwidth to, this, to the entire system so effectively what happens is as the load increases, the system capacity also increases. P2P system, another hallmark of P2P systems is that they are self-organizing. They tend to organize around content of interest. So what, what you find happening is that when there's a particular file of interest, there's a small subgroup of peers that form highly connected graph that is very resonant to even, in, even when the peers themselves have variable connectivity. Now, on the flip side of the coin, it's the ISP's view of P2P. One of the problems with P2P is that the peers form unstructured overlays in the sense that they connect randomly to other peers. And that is totally ignorant of the underlying network topology and tends to increase traffic on costly transit links. Another thing is that ISPs will admit that P2P does encourage broadband subscriptions. However, because a lot of ISPs don't charge per bit on the wire, like the, the surge in traffic is not, doesn't really equate to additional income or revenue for ISPs. So what am I hinting at here? I'm hinting at the half of the problem, which is the duality of P2P in terms of it's cheap for end users and at the same time it's expensive for internet service providers. Initially, what ISPs did to reduce the operational cost of P2P is that they installed network devices that scan incoming packets on the network. That, at that point, P2P, P2P networks used use fixed ports, so it was really easy to identify P2P traffic. ISP scanned, detected the traffic, and <coughs> throttled it in terms of blocking that traffic. That led to an increase in download time for users. As a result, developers retaliated, and they Initially, they switched to random arbitrary port numbers. ISPs then, again, installed more advanced devices that used deep packet inspection and other technologies to detect P2P traffic. ISPs and um, developers again retaliated and started encrypting their messages. So we see this cat and mouse game happening between ISPs and developers. And although recently, at the end of last year, the Federal Communications Commission mandated that ISPs, it's illegal for ISPs to throttle traffic, and ISPs are obviously going to challenge that, that ruling based on the premise that it's their network and they should be able to do as they please. So, they, so there isn't anything, there isn't any tenable solution yet to this problem, and more importantly, what we want to identify is that it has damaged the relationship between ISPs and developers. So, what are our goals? So our goal is to build a new network device. A network device that would, like the other devices, reduce operational cost of P2P. However, notably, our device will not degrade application performance for end users. So we, so basically our device is this, uh, is a, proves that ISPs can take unilateral action to reduce P2P network costs without and when their subscribers, and at the same time, make peace with developers because of their initial missteps. So we call our device PEER, and which stands for P2P Enhanced Edge Router. And one thing to note is that PEER, even when ISPs install PEER, they are not liable for copyright infringement because PEER is protected under the Safe Harbor Clause of the Digital Media Copyright Act. So I guess the next question is, how, do, how does P2P actually increase transit traffic and 
what did we do to reduce transit traffic during the night to day? So let's take a step back for a minute and go through a typical client server architecture where imagine a user downloading a file from a web page. What this is a client, this is <coughs> What, and this is a costly transit link. Notice that, consider from the um, access ISP's perspective, the green oval. What, what you should note is that traffic within the access ISP's network is essentially free. What's really expensive is this traffic on the transit link, the link between the transit ISP and the access ISP. Typical file download situation, each user downloads a file, bits travels the link only once. So how does P2P change the game? So let's consider a P2P system. Notice now from the perspective of the access ISP again, we have a user, we'll call him Bob. He downloads a file, as usual, from the internet, costs the ISP some money. <coughs> then, then, then this is what happens. He then decides to, he then starts uploading the file again to share with another user and another ISP. So that is basically doubling the cost of the ISP for the same file. So a fair question to ask is why didn't Bob decide to share with Alice on, on the same network? I mean, really, Bob didn't even know that there was a, a local pay on his, on his own network. And that's really where the fundamental problem exists, that Bob is unaware of existing locality within the network. If Bob knew about this ISP local peer, he could have decided to share with her and save some money. And also note that on the local network, the, the, the links are usually a lot faster. So he could be improving performance for himself as well as saving the ISP some money. So before we continue any further, our device, we identified BitTorrent as one of the target protocols for our device. So we chose BitTorrent because the large body of research on BitTorrent, which is a file sharing or file distribution <coughs> protocol. And a lot of research has shown that BitTorrent is particularly locality unaware. In fact, when there's like 70 to 90% of content available within the local network, BitTorrent still downloads the content externally. So I'm briefly going to describe how BitTorrent works in the context of... So this is a web server and um, a, a tracker and a new peer. The tracker is basically the peer discovery mechanism, as you'll see. And imagine that there are a group of other peers right now downloading content, right, or redistributing content. Note, note that the unit of exchange is not the entire file, but chunks, pieces of the file. It's typically 256K, so for one megabyte file, imagine it's, it's, it's being split up into four chunks. So what happens initially is that to the peer goes to a website, download something called a torrent file that contains, it's a, it's a meta info file, a metadata file that contains, among other things, the URL of a tracker. So what happens is that a new peer contacts the tracker in order to obtain a list of peers already sharing the file that he's interested in. The tracker now importantly returns a random list of available, known available peers. Then Bob, again, connects to one of, connects to the peers in the tracker's response and begins sharing. What we also want to introduce is a couple of terms. One term is called a leecher. A leecher is a user, a P2P, a peer, that doesn't have the entire file. So he's trying to download missing pieces of the file. And there's something else called a seeder, which has the complete copy of the file. And he's only uploading content, he's not downloading. So these are just two terms, in addition to the tracker. The tracker is what our, how our device really, the central focus of our device. Because we notice that the tracker returns a random list of peers. And that is where the problem really begins, because the tracker is totally unaware of the location Appears. So our device basically, as we'll see, emulates an ISP local tracker. So basically, P2, our, our device called Peer is installed along the edge routers, the ISP's edge routers, and effectively what it does, instead of returning a random list of peers, it returns a list of only local peers. So effectively, it would reduce the transit traffic and at the same time, it will show it doesn't degrade performance for end users. So peer works on control traffic. Control traffic is a traffic where a peer queries a tracker for a list 
Agora, 